Thanks, Jesse. Good morning, everyone. Great to be with you again this morning to uh, worship God. Uh, thanks, team, for leading us in that. And uh, also, Mark for, and Sharani and Hamish for um, yeah, reminding us uh, of God's work around the world <clears throat> and how we, as his people, are called to support that, engage in that, uh, whether it is in aid and development situations uh, like Cambodia or whether it's through Bible translation in Mozambique uh, or um, evangelism and ministry training uh, in Asia. Uh, three ways in which we as a church are engaged in God's wider work in the world and not just seeking to reach out to our community. So thanks, Mark, for continuing to bring that uh, in front of us. Well, today we commence uh, a new five-week series called One Thing. Uh, now, perhaps you've heard a parent say this to a child. If there's one thing I've ever taught you, it's this. Or maybe someone who's retiring and they say, if there's one thing I've learned over my career, it's this. Or a mentor who says, look after this one thing and the rest will take care of themselves. I'm sure we've all heard those types of statements at some point in our lives. When this phrase, one thing, is used, it usually doesn't mean that there is literally only one thing. We use this phrase in a way that suggests out of all the things, there is one that stands out above the others. Or if only one thing is possible, then this is the key one. Well, five times in the Bible, this phrase, one thing, appears. And as we'll see over the next five weeks, these one things put together are actually the stepping stones of a life of following Jesus. Together they form the pathway of a life of discipleship. Now, I've found these quite helpful in my life because at times it feels like the Christian life is difficult and complicated. There are a lot of things to believe, to do, to know, and to prioritize. And there are times when I feel like I'm getting a little overwhelmed or even distracted by many good things, but not the best things. And so these five one things have been helpful for me in distilling down which out of all the things are the main things. And if I constantly walk along these one thing stepping stones, I can be confident I'm following in the ways of Jesus. Basically, if I take care of these five one things, everything else will take care of itself. And so today, we look at our first one thing stepping stone, a story from Mark chapter 10, which was just read for us. But let me ask a question first. We just heard a famous statement from Jesus in the passage just read to us. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, I've got a question for you to ponder. For Jesus' statement to come true, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle... Does the camel need to get smaller or the needle bigger? Ponder on that and I may come back to discuss it later on, but for the moment, let's pray. Loving God, uh, we come now before not only your word in terms of the scripture, but the word, Jesus Christ. And his words that explain to us what it means to know you, to be in relationship with you and to inherit eternal life. Lord, these are profound words that are not something that we should hear as cliched or just roll off the tongue because we've said them so many times before. Lord, no matter whether this is the first time we're encountering these words from Jesus or the millionth time. Lord, may they have a profound impact on us this morning. 
May we be open to what you would be saying to us this morning. By your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our story today kicks off with a question, a very important question. In fact, it's the exact question, perhaps phrased somewhat differently, that most people throughout history have asked at some point. And we see it in the first couple of verses. Verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an existential question that acknowledges two fundamental realities. Firstly, we are all mortal. Basic assumption that 100% of humanity throughout history have died. We're all mortal. No one has figured out how to live forever. The second reality that it acknowledges is that the prospect of something after this life. And the, so the question essentially is, how do I make sure that I'm headed where I want to head, not to somewhere else? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Basically, how do I get into heaven? Just about everyone throughout history has asked a variant of this question at some point. Even those who claim there is no God or no heaven still wrestle with the question, is this life all there is? And the, for the vast majority of people throughout the world, there is a fundamental belief that there is something next. Some people claim that there's nothing, but that's a very small minority. The vast majority of people across this world acknowledge that there is something of some form or other beyond this existence. They might not have a handle on what it exactly is, but they're confident that this earthly life is a stepping stone towards something else. But not only that, this question the guy comes with in this passage today reveals something deeper. Not just that there is something next but that what comes next is affected by something in the now the man asks what must i do to inherit eternal life it's a recognition that something about who i am in this life determines who or where i end up in the next it's a belief shared by the vast majority of the world how do I get this right, this life right, so that the next one is what I hope for? And so this man, who we understand from information gleaned from other Gospels, is a rich young man with significant influence and power. He comes up to Jesus, whom he sees as a good teacher, and asks this age-old question, what must I do to inherit eternal life and we read on to see Jesus response verse 18 uh, verse 19 why do you call me good Jesus answered no one is good except God alone now some people have jumped on this to suggest that Jesus here is implying that he is not God but Jesus makes no such implication here in fact if Jesus wasn't God and was just a good Jewish rabbi, then he'd more likely jump in quickly and say something far clearer, like, don't call me good, for only God is good. But he doesn't say, don't call me good. Instead, he asks a clever rhetorical question to get the man thinking. It's like he's saying, it's quite interesting that you call me good, because only God is good. What are you saying? when you call me that. It's a way Jesus was able to get people contemplating his identity as more than just a good teacher without landing him in even more trouble than he was already creating. So in that context, rather than being a denial of his divinity, it's about, it's about as close as you can get to claiming to be God without explicitly doing so. And having left that little gem hanging there, for the man and the onlookers to reflect on, 
Jesus goes on to answer the man's question. Well, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Jesus here, of course, is quoting from the Ten Commandments. Now, by the time of Jesus, the Ten Commandments were kind of divided into two sections. So the first table which was the first four commands, and, uh, which were the laws relating to humanity's relationship with God. And then there was a second table, laws 5 through to 10, which apply to our relationship with one another. Which is why Jesus, later on, when someone comes up and says, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says, love the Lord your God, first table, then love your neighbour as yourself, second table. They fall into two tables, two categories. And it was these Ten Commandments which were the guiding principles by which Jews were to live and to obey God. Essentially, obey these laws and you'll be found righteous before God. So Jesus rattles off a number of commands from that second table of the law. Exactly what the people hearing would expect is the measurement of righteousness and the requirement for qualifying for eternal life. And once again, for a lot of people in this world, that's what they believe is the measurement of living a good enough life. I haven't murdered anyone. I haven't stolen anything. I haven't cheated on my wife. I love my kids. I'm a pretty good person generally. I think I've lived a good enough life that whatever comes after this life shouldn't be too bad. You know, on the scale of downright evil to perfect, I'm maybe a solid seven or eight. I'm above average, or I'm, at least I'm not terrible. Well, if most of us say we're a seven or eight, then this guy was way better than that. We see his response to Jesus in verse 20. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now, In Aussie culture, that sounds pretty arrogant, doesn't it? Just bragging about how good he is. But in this context, no one would have argued with him. According to the perspective of those listening in that day, the evidence of this guy's situation in life backed up his claim. You see, in that culture, the view was that if you were wealthy, healthy and powerful then God's favour was upon you. Effectively, God rewarded those who were good and obedient. So the fact that this guy was young, rich and powerful was evidence to the people that he must have somehow ticked all the boxes in terms of pleasing God. And yet clearly, even with all that, this man wasn't satisfied. He wasn't comfortable or secure in that notion that he had pleased God enough. Sure, he was young, wealthy, upright, a top bloke. He had everything and yet he still had this gnawing feeling that something more was required. Something he was missing. Something he lacked. That's why he's coming to this religious leader, desperate to find that missing ingredient. And it says these beautiful words in verse 21. Jesus looked at him and loved him. You almost get this visceral sense of compassion and pity that Jesus has for this guy. As Jesus looks at him and sees how desperate he is, to do the right thing. So desperate to please God, to get everything right in order to qualify for eternal life. Jesus looks at him, probably thinking to himself, you've tried so hard in your life to do what it takes. You've done everything you can to please God, but you don't realize what it is you still lack. And Jesus goes on, one thing you lack. Go, sell everything and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. 
Now, I reckon when this guy heard Jesus say, one thing you lack, his initial feeling would have been one of excitement. He was almost there. Only one thing was standing between him and eternal life. But the excitement of being so close to working his way into heaven was quickly snuffed out as Jesus put his finger on the heart of the matter. The one thing that was preventing him from seeing eternal life. Now, what was Jesus saying here? That all this man needed to do was give everything to the poor? That the only thing this man was lacking from a life of perfection was a bit of generosity? Well, maybe. Maybe he was that good. But I'm pretty sure something deeper is going on here. And it's revealed in the man's response. Verse 22. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus exposes what's really holding this guy back from eternal life. It wasn't anything from the second table of the law. He was doing that really well. It was something from the first table. In fact, it was the very first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. You see, if this man literally only lacked that one thing, if he could guarantee eternal life by giving his wealth away to the poor, then surely he would have done it straight away. I mean, he'd worked so hard to be obedient all his life. Since he was a little boy, he's ticked off every single little thing to work his way to eternal life. So if it was as simple as doing this one act, then surely he would have done it straight away. Sorted eternal life, here I come. But the problem was, for this man, it wasn't that simple. What should have been an easy decision turns out to be a major dilemma. Because for this guy, money was not just money. It was his God. Jesus puts it this way in Luke chapter 16. No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So Jesus is not telling this man he literally lacks only one thing. He's challenging him with the notion that out of all the things this man lacks, the most important, the most material, the most consequential is that God was not the one who was sitting on the throne of his heart. He worshipped another God. That's what's holding him back from eternal life. That's why he had this gnawing uncertainty in his life, despite all his success and personal holiness. Out of all the things that this guy was lacking, it wasn't what he did or didn't do that was most important. The one thing that was important was the attitude of his heart, his relationship with God. And as the young man walks away, choosing to keep on to his wealth and reject the invitation to follow Jesus on the path of eternal life, verse 23, Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. They were amazed at his words because, remember, in their culture, the view was that the rich were close to God. They were favoured by God. This guy must have been very pleasing to God to end up as wealthy and powerful as he is. So for Jesus to say that it's hard for the rich to enter heaven was counter to everything they assumed. But Jesus said again, children how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, all sorts of theories have arisen over the decades about what Jesus is saying here in order to soften what appears to be a pretty harsh line. These theories have broadly come up somewhat coincidentally in this most prosperous and flourishing West in the last few decades because we are rich and we don't like the sound of it being especially hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So we sit there and go, hmm, maybe Jesus is talking about something else. Maybe there's an allegory or metaphor or something else going on here that we can kind of soften the blow. And one of those theories is that there was a gate in the wall of Jerusalem that was called the Eye of the Needle. And that it was a a narrow gate. It was one of the smaller gates in the wall of Jerusalem, which meant that when travellers would approach the wall of the city, they couldn't get their camels through unless they unloaded the camels, you know, took all the baggage off, then the camel could squeeze through and then, you know, bring the, the, the other stuff in afterwards or leave it outside or something or other, this kind of allegory to say that, you know, what Jesus is saying is that for the rich to enter the kingdom of glory, uh, they would have to just offload their riches before they kind of fit through the, the narrow gate. The being rich is something that prevents us from getting into heaven. But there are two problems with that theory. Firstly, there is no historical evidence of any kind that such a name was given to a wall or a gate in Jerusalem. Secondly, if it was that simple, if all we had to do was jettison everything we have to fit through the gate, then it would be again easy, wouldn't it? We would just bequeath our wealth to a charity in our will, show the will to St. Peter at the pearly gates, see, I've given it all away, I'm no longer rich, and then stroll on in because we've jettisoned off everything. We just waltz waltz on through. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus is saying. What Jesus' point here is, it's, it's not a metaphor, nor is it exaggeration. He's meaning this literally. It is easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Which is why the disciples respond the way they do. In verse 26, the disciples were even more amazed. Jesus is doubling down on this confounding, bizarre statement he's made. And they say to each other, who then can be saved? The reality of what Jesus is saying is dawning on them all. They're all thinking, if this guy can't be saved, if even this rich young ruler isn't good enough, then what hope have the rest of us got? And that's exactly Jesus' point. Notice in verse 24, he says, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God for anyone not just the rich. It is hard to enter the kingdom of God. We are all facing a camel and needle situation. Not just those of us who are rich. Every single one of us is a camel standing in front of a needle contemplating how on earth are we going to fit through. Now, this is both bad and good news. We all have one thing we lack. No matter how good or evil we are, no matter how successful or unsuccessful we may be, powerful or weak, beautiful or ugly, rich or poor, no matter how loved or lonely we are, all of us lack one thing and one thing only. We all lack the ability. We all lack the capacity to make it through the eye of that needle. Everyone falls short. None of us make the cut. 
no matter how practically perfect someone may be, they are still a camel standing in front of a needle. We all face the impossible. But here's the good news. Verse 27, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. It's here I want to return to the question I asked at the beginning. In order for a camel to get through the eye of a needle, does the camel need to get smaller or does the needle need to get bigger? In other words, are we supposed to be better, to measure up, offload our riches, live perfect lives in order to fit through this exceptionally small target? Or does God have to ease up on evil? You know, make it not so hard to get through. So, you know, relax the criteria in order to make the opening wider so that more of us can get through to eternal life. Surely it's got to be one of the two. Either we need to be perfect or God has to lower the entry bar and accept evil entering into his eternal kingdom. Either the camel needs to get smaller or the needle needs to get bigger. What other option is there? Well, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We all fall short. But through his death on the cross, Jesus made up for our shortcomings. He took upon himself every one of our failures, paid the price and made us clean. So, we don't have to be perfect, but nor does God have to accept evil. The camel didn't need to get smaller and the needle didn't have to get bigger. Through Jesus on the cross, God did the impossible. That imperfect, flawed, failed people like ourselves who fall short somehow are made perfect enough to fit through the needle. What is impossible with man is possible with God. So this man comes to Jesus that day and asks the ultimate question, how do I inherit eternal life? How do I earn my way there? What more can I do? And Jesus replies, mate, out of all the things that disqualify you for the kingdom, probably not just your generosity issue, there's lots of things that disqualify you from perfection, but there is one thing that stands out above all the rest. Take care of this one thing and the rest will take care of itself. One thing you lack, the decision to accept that you can't do it on your own. You can't fit through that eye of the needle. You can't earn your place. You can never be good enough. But guess what? You don't need to be because I love you. I paid the price for you and I forgive you. Sadly, this man couldn't do it. He walked away from Jesus that day. He still had his youth. He still had his money. He still had his power and influence he still had his good bloke status but he still lacked one thing the simple decision that would lead to eternal life to accept that he didn't have to earn his way to eternal life 
and simply rely on the love and grace of God shown in the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Let me ask you today, in amongst the many reasons that disqualify you and I for the kingdom of God, have you dealt with the one thing that matters most? Do you take care of that one thing and all the rest are taken care of? Isn't that good news? Isn't that the best news? That out of all the things and all the ways that we have failed in our lives, all the ways that we fall short, all the ways that we look back on all our history and think so much shame and guilt and embarrassment and regret and contrition, the ways in which we think, I would love to to turn back time. I would love to do something different. I would love to be freed of this burden that I carry of not measuring up, of not being perfect. There is only one thing we lack in order to just get rid of all of that. And that is simply to come before Jesus and say, thank you for taking all of that upon yourself. That's one thing, one thing we lack is the decision to say, here it is, Jesus, here's all my failure, here's all my rubbish, here's all my shame, all my failings, and he takes it gladly. So somehow, a big fat camel like me can fit through an eye of a needle what remarkable grace what remarkable love you surrender your life to Christ and accept his grace none of the shortcomings or failures in your life matter one iota so the question for all of us is as we walk out of here today Do we walk away like this young man, still lacking that one thing? Or do we walk away lacking nothing? Because in Christ Jesus, we've been given it all. One thing. It's not much, but it's a lot. Let's pray. like to give you this opportunity to just have a think and reflect and contemplate if you're somebody who perhaps has never yet come to that point of recognizing that one crucial thing you lack despite maybe how hard you've tried at being a good person or how hard you've tried to reduce the amount of failing in your life. You haven't yet come to that realisation and decided to give Jesus whatever failings, flaws, shame and guilt you have in your life. I want to give you that opportunity now, just in quietness, to experience the wonderful, life-giving freedom that comes from handing all of that over to Jesus and allowing him to take upon himself all your guilt, all your shame, to walk in the freedom of grace. And take your time now just in silence in your mind to hand that over. To just visually hand over all of that to Jesus and give him thanks that through his death he took upon himself all of that baggage and now you have eternal life ahead of you because of his grace if you're somebody who has made that decision in your life before then simply reflect now and give him thanks that that baggage that rubbish that 
guilt and shame of your past no longer has consequence, no longer has relevance, for he has dealt with it. What amazing grace he has shown. Lord God, we do give you thanks for your love and your grace towards us, that out of all the things that disqualify us from a life everlasting, you've dealt with it all. And there is just one thing we need to deal with, and that is simply to accept your forgiveness. Simply to accept that Jesus has paid it all. Who else could offer us this redemption? Who else could offer us this freedom and gift of eternal life than God? The one who loves us. The one who created us. The one who has redeemed us through his son, Jesus. Lord, we give you praise and thanks for all you have done. For each one of us. Through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.